Good, good, good. Well, I'm going to ask uh, my dad to come on up. He's going to lead us in the scripture reading. If you could stand, take your Bibles, turn to Isaiah 43. Isaiah 43, we're going to, on Sundays, when right before the scripture, I'll ask someone to read the scripture reading and uh, lead the congregation in reading the Word of God together. Isaiah 43, hopefully you have a Bible. If you don't, look on with someone else. And then, uh, so I'm going to ask my pops, Bob Miller. We moved here in uh, the spring of 1988. Did, did we start attending here right away? We sure did. Right away. And uh, so uh, my family's been here for a, a number of years. And uh, it's a privilege to introduce my dad to come up and lead us in the scripture reading today. And so he's going to lead you in a responsive reading. So he'll begin with the first verse of the passage Isaiah 43, 14 through 21, and then you can join him on the second out loud and so on through the end of the passage, and then he will uh, lead the congregation in prayer, and then I have a message for you. So, Pops, why don't you come on up and lead us in that? Thank you, Josh. So, Isaiah 43, starting with the 14th verse, and we're going down to the 21st verse. And I'll start, and you do the second, and I'll read with you, and then I'll do the third, and then the fourth one. Etc. We're not used to this, so I was just trying to, you know, so it goes out right. Okay, you ready? Thus saith the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, for your sake I have sent to Babylon, and have brought down all their nobles and the Chaldeans, whose cry is in the ships. I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. Thus saith the Lord, which maketh a way in the sea, and a path in the mighty waters which bringeth forth the chariot and horse, the army and the power. They shall lie down together. They shall not rise. They are extinct. They are quenched as tow. Remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall ye not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The beast of the field shall honor me, the dragons and the owls, because I give waters in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to my people, my chosen. This people have I formed for myself. They shall show forth my praise. Thank you, let's pray. Father God, we thank you again for the reading of your word. It's so precious, and you said to hear your words. And God, I pray you will absorb that today and in the preaching of your word from Josh, that we'll meditate on the things that are said from your word, and it'll do a good work in our hearts and our minds and our souls. Thank you for all that attended today. We're looking for a blessing, Father. Please, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Pops. Keep your Bibles open. We are a church that uses the Bible, amen? And so we will use the Bible throughout the message today. Didn't the musicians do a wonderful job? Thank the Lord for uh, Hannah playing the piano, for Dick playing clarinet. Where's Dick? Is, did he step out of here? Okay. Playing the clarinet and then, of course, the special music. And then I want to thank those who uh, hosted the progressive dinner last night. Uh, what a blessing uh, that uh, we got a chance to go to some different homes and have some good food and uh, fellowship, and it was just great. Uh, our first week, it's hard to believe that we've only been here less than a week. I feel like we've been here three weeks. We fit so much in this week, unpacking and just trying to get a lot of stuff done. If we didn't get a chance to meet you, please, my wife and I would like to meet you. Our phone numbers are in the bulletin. Um, if we can be a help to you, please let us know. Text, call, if we can pray for you, if there's anything we can do. Uh, don't do this. Well, the pastor's too busy. This is why we're here. Amen. We're here to serve you, to be a help to you, to be a blessing to you. So we can't help you if we don't know what you're struggling with, what you need prayer for. So please reach out to us. We would like to be a blessing to you. Isaiah 43. Oh, I, want, I do want to say one thing. I, you know, I was looking at, I have a, a Bible that I was given by my parents my, uh, when I was 14 years old for Christmas. Uh, so let's see, 
uh, to Joshua R. Miller by Mom and Pa, Christmas, December 25th, 1986. So Pastor Beam, this was two years before my family moved up here. And I was looking through this the other day and I opened this up and there is from August of 1994, Pastor Bemis, things that God expects a Christian to know. And I wrote an outline here of six points. And you say, why are you saying that? You never know who the pipsqueak in the congregation now will be the pastor many years from now. Amen. <laughs> so, uh, Pastor Bemis, thank you. Um, you invested in me in many of my formative years. And I just thank God. It's such a privilege. And uh, I've took many a notes over the years uh, and learned many, many things. There was a pilot with three passengers aboard the small plane that he was flying, a, a boy scout, an older Buddhist monk, and an atomic scientist. During the flight, the plane developed engine trouble, and so the pilot, you know, of course, they got all the gear on their heads, radioed over the intercom to just a few passengers he had. The plane is going down. We only have only three parachutes, and there are four of us. I have a family waiting for me at home. I must survive. With that, he grabbed one of the parachutes and jumped out of the plane. The atomic scientist jumped to his feet at this point and declared, I'm the smartest man in the world. It would be a great tragedy if my life was snuffed out. With that, he also grabbed a parachute and exited the plane. With an alarmed look on his face, the Buddhist monk said to the Boy Scout, My young friend... I have no family and I've lived many, many years. You're still young with much ahead of you. You take the last parachute. At that point, the Boy Scout interrupted the monk and said, Hold on, sir. Don't say anymore. We're all right. The world's smartest man just jumped out of the plane with my backpack on his back. <laughs> you know, isn't it interesting how a, a new perspective can change our outlook when we think one thing and it's actually another from bleak to bright? with just a few well-chosen words. This morning, I want to preach a sermon entitled, When God Begins Something New, or When God Does Something New, from the passage that Pops led us in this morning, Isaiah 43. God is in the business of making things new. We will use our Bible some. I'm going to quote some of these scriptures to you. Uh, so follow me, and then I'll have you turn to some scriptures. But all through the Psalms, we see the psalmist singing new songs. I could, I could list dozens of songs. I'll give you one, Psalm 40, verse 3. And he, talking about God, has put a new song in my mouth. Even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord. We know that God's mercies are new every morning. Aren't you thankful for that? Lamentations 3.22. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Ezekiel speaks about a new heart and a new spirit that God would put within his people Israel. Ezekiel 33, 26, a new heart also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you. We know that Isaiah at the end of this book speaks about the future. Uh, when God says this, this is a day that is coming in the future. We uh, pray sooner rather than later for behold in Isaiah 65, 17, I create new heavens and a new earth. And the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. We thank God for Jesus Christ bringing in the New Testament with his blood. Matthew 26, 28, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Thank God we no longer are under the Old Testament. Amen. Uh, thank God for his son bringing in the New Testament, the new covenant with his blood. Uh, the New Testament speaks of a new creature. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. It's funny, thinking about creatures, it seemed like all the way across the country as we traveled, I kept seeing uh, people with bumper stickers or stickers in the back of their vehicle with the Sasquatch figure. You, ever, you seen those? Must be a big thing, especially in this neck of the woods. How many of you ever seen Sasquatch before? Okay. We'll set up a counseling appointment if you have. Uh, after. This is not what God was speaking about. God was speaking about a, 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 a Christian, somebody who uh, once was not saved and now is saved. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all through the epistles in the New Testament, there are references to the new man. Pastor, you've taught on the new man and the old man hundreds of times in your life. 
because it's all through the Bible. And Revelation speaks of the new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven. And in our text today of Isaiah 43, God's speaking to his beloved nation of Israel, and he tells them something in verse number 19. Look at this. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. In this old Bible, I have this Schofield that I was given, and these are notes I've written down when Pastor Beam was teaching years ago. I have this little note. Every verse of Scripture has three applications. Number one, historical. Number two, spiritual. Number three, doctrinal. And that's a good, um, it's a good little iteration to follow when you uh, look at the Bible because it's important that you uh, preach or teach or learn the Bible in context. And although this passage is specifically referring to the nation of Israel, from a spiritual application, we can glean some important truths to help us as a Christian, to help us uh, as people that are trying to follow God. And I aim to help each and every one of you today as we look at this subject of when God begins something new. So I'm going to give you point number one. First of all, a declaration of who he is. A declaration of who he is. Look with me at verse number 14 and 15. Verse number 14 and 15. Thus saith the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, for your sake I have sent to Babylon and have brought down all their nobles and the Chaldeans whose cry is in the ships. <clears throat> now notice verse 15. I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your who? King. Your King. A declaration of who he is. Before God is interested in what he can do for you, he wants you to know who he is. Who is God to you? Is he someone who bails you out when things get tough? That you cry out to only when you're in the pit of despair? Is he a magic genie to rub when you want some wishes granted? Someone just up in the heavens, apparently there, but by judging your life recently, not interested in what you're doing. When you read your Bible, you do read the Word each day, don't you? Amen. I hope so. You might be here and say, you know, I struggle with that, Pastor. I want to encourage you. I, I don't want to dump the guilt on you, but I want to encourage you to get in the only book that will bring life to you each and every day. Amen. The book that will help you, that will strengthen you, that will guide you. When you read your Bible, do you look to learn more about who God is every day? Who God claims to be? You know, there are some people that read the Bible. They just want to find some magic formula for their life. And there are some things that God has promised in this Bible. But if you'll start looking for who God is and you find God, let me tell you, everything else in your life will fall in place. You want to know who God is? Study Jesus. For Jesus is God in the flesh. Do you realize that Jesus can be found in every book of the Bible? Genesis. He's, a, he's our creator and promised redeemer. In Exodus, he's the Passover lamb. In Leviticus, he's the high priest. In Numbers, he is the water in a dry and thirsty desert. In Deuteronomy, he becomes the curse for us. Joshua, he is the commander of the army of the Lord. In Judges, he delivers us from injustice. Ruth, he's our kinsman redeemer. In 1 Samuel, he is our all-in-one, the prophet, the priest, and the king. 2 Samuel, he's the king of grace and love. 1 Kings, he's a ruler greater than Solomon, and Solomon was a great king. In 2 Kings, he's the powerful prophet. In 1 Chronicles, the son of David that is coming to rule. In 2 Chronicles, the king who reigns eternally. In Ezra, he is the priest proclaiming freedom. In Nehemiah, the one who restores what is broken down. In Esther, he's the protector of his people. In Job, he's the mediator between God and man. In Psalms, he's our song in the morning and our song in the night. In Proverbs, he is our wisdom. In Ecclesiastes, our meaning for life. In a life, many people looking for what is the meaning of life. This valley is full of hundreds, yea, thousands of people looking for the meaning of life. And some of them have moved here recently thinking that if they get here to the Flathead Valley, they would find the meaning of life. And they become disappointed. Right. Don't get me wrong. I grew up here. I love the mountains. I love the snow. People out in New Jersey thought I was crazy. Every time I snowed, I was singing. They were grumbling, okay? I like the snow. I, I like this area. I, I thank God God's called us back here. 
But that's not the answer to life, the Flathead Valley. Amen? The Song of Solomon, he's the author of a faithful love and an enduring love. Isaiah, he is our suffering servant. In Jeremiah, he is the, the weeping Messiah. In Lamentations, he assumes God's wrath for us. In Ezekiel, he's the son of man. In Daniel, he is the stranger, yea, the stranger that is in the fire with us. Hosea, he is the faithful husband even when we run away and are not faithful. Joel, he is sending his spirit to his people. In Amos, he delivers justice to the oppressed. Obadiah, he's the judge of those who do evil. Jonah, he is the greatest missionary. Micah, he casts our sin behind his back into the sea of forgetfulness. Praise the Lord. In Nahum, he proclaims future world peace we cannot even imagine. In Habakkuk, he crushes injustice. A lot of the minor prophets speaks of, in, of injustice and the justice that Jesus will bring someday. In Zephaniah, he's the warrior who saves. In Haggai, he restores our worship. In Zachary, Zechariah, Messiah pierced for us. Malachi, he is the son of righteousness, capital S-U-N, of righteousness, who brings healing. In Matthew, he's a Messiah who is king. In Mark, he's the Messiah who's a servant. In Luke, the Messiah who is man. But in John, he's the Messiah who is God in the flesh. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Amen? In Acts, he's the Spirit who dwells in his people. In Romans, he's the righteousness of God. In 1 Corinthians, he's the power and love of God. In 2 Corinthians, he's the down payment of what's to come. In Galatians, he's our very life. In Ephesians, he's the unity of our church. Amen. In Philippians, he's the joy of our life. In Colossians, he's the preeminence in all things. In 1 Thessalonians, he's our comfort in the last day. 2 Thessalonians, he's our returning king. In 1 Timothy, he's the savior of the worst sinners. 2 Timothy, he's the leader of the leaders. In Titus, he's the foundation of truth. Philemon, he's our mediator. In Hebrews, he's our high priest. In James, he matures our faith. In 1 Peter, he's our hope in times of suffering. In 2 Peter, the one who guards us from false teaching. In 1 John, he's the source of all fellowship. In 2 John, he's God, God in the flesh. In 3 John, he's the source of all truth. Jude, he protects us from stumbling. In Revelation, he's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen? He's the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. He's coming again. And he's the one who makes all things new. Do you know him today? Do you know him? Oh, pastor, I've heard about him. No, do you know him? He wants you to know who he is before he ever wants to do something for you. So often, we are consumer Christians. What can you do for me, God? And God says, get to know me. Isn't this what the modern dating scene is? The hookup culture? Hey, what can you do? How can you make me feel before I get to know you? I've mentioned this before. I don't know if here, but... My wife and I went to a college, imagine this, where the boys and girls were in separate dorms. <laughs> the guys weren't even allowed to be in the girls' dorms. We'd get sent out of there. You know what that forced us to do? I had to get to know her. I had to get to know her, and she had to get to know me before our relationship matured. And so often, we just want what God wants without knowing who He is. So we see, first of all, when God begins something new, he gives a declaration of who he is. And this is what he says to Israel there in verse number 15. I am the Lord, your holy one, the creator of Israel, your king. And I want you to see number, point number two, a declaration of what he can do. So now he moves into what he can do. Look at verse 16 and 17. Thus saith the Lord, which maketh a way in the sea and a path in the mighty waters, which bringeth forth the chariot and horse, the army and the power, they shall lie down together. They shall not rise. They are extinct. They are quenched as tow. What a God. A God who can make a way in the sea. A God who can guide you through the mighty waters. Hey, the, the, the Bible here is a record of the mighty exploits of God and what he can do. Yes, get to know him. But yes, God wants to do some mighty things. Read those records. Dwell on those exploits. Claim the promises. Look around at the lives of God's people here at church. Get to know the testimonies of how God changed their life. I don't know some of you very well. Some of you I don't know at all. I look forward to hearing your testimony. Pastor, I was, you and I were talking this week about your testimony. And you mentioned, you said, it's a miracle. It's a miracle what God did with you. But you know, every person here that's saved has a miracle story. 
It's just different. It's just different. I, I know the story of my parents. They've shared with me. I, I know the story of my brother. I'm so glad my brother's here today. And uh, I know myself. And we all have stories of how God saved us. And one of the reasons that we gather together is not just to learn his word, but to showcase what he's done in our lives for his sake. We come not to see, hey, how good. No, look what God's done in my life. Look what God's done in his life, in her life. Look what God's delivered them from. And you need to hear what God has done in others' lives because what he's done in their life, he can do in yours. And God's just waiting to do a mighty work in each of your lives if you would but ask him. You have not because you ask not. I'm convinced by the study of the scriptures that God is much more prone to do mighty things in our lives if we would but ask him. A declaration of who he is, a, a declaration of what he can do. Now follow me. We're going to get real. We're going to get real here. Point number three, a duty to forget the past. Now look at verse 18. Look at verse 18. God's speaking here. Remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Let's talk about the hope that some of you have for this church. Many of you here today hope for a good future here at Bible Baptist Church, and I'm with you. But it might be that some of you are shackled by what's happened in the past. Maybe at another church. Maybe in this church. Uh, perhaps somebody has said something to you. Somebody treated you, uh, perhaps not in a right way. But let me tell you about what a church is. A church is a body of baptized believer, believers who assembled together apart from the world around the word of God with the spirit of God led by a man of God. And this group of people is far from perfect. And this pastor right here is far from perfect. None of my family members say too loud of an amen. Yeah, Andrew's trying. <laughs> and if you think about joining this church, you'll join a group, get this now, of imperfect people. We don't have it all together. And I've only been here five days. <laughs> I can't imagine as I go along, right? Uh, no. Hey, you don't believe me? Do you know how Paul described himself the further he went along in the Christian life? Get your Bibles. Keep your finger there in Isaiah 43. Go to the New Testament, 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. You have a duty to forget the past. Now, look at this. Look at 1 Timothy 1. Look at verse number 15. 1 Timothy 1.15. 1 Timothy 1.15, God's word says this. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Would you finish the last part of the verse with me? Of whom I am chief. He says, present tense. Of whom I am chief. Not, not of who I was, who I am. Now, some of you need to forget the past when it comes to something that might have happened to you at another church. Or happened to you at this church. I, I'm, I'm just telling you. You're here today, but you're holding some grudge against something, uh, against somebody that happened perhaps in a previous church or happened with the previous pastors here. Now, I, I want to encourage you. Don't come and tell me what happened to you. I don't want to hear all the bad things about previous pastors. We have a duty to forget the past. Remember ye not the former things. And you say, preacher, I can't forget the past. Here's what you do to help you move forward. You forgive those who've hurt you in the past. Amen. Say, it's easier said than done. Of course, it's hard. God doesn't call you to easy in the Christian life. If you fail to forgive those around you, what you're doing every day is getting up in the morning, you're putting on an invisible backpack filled with bitterness. And bitterness occurs in your life when you ref refuse to forgive the person who hurt you. And you think you're hurting the other person, or you're getting back to the other person, what you're doing is you're putting on that backpack every day, and you're just filling it. And bitterness is a secret killer. Bitterness will kill your spirit. Bitterness will kill your marriage. Bitterness will kill your family. Your bitterness might keep this church family from going forward here in 2024 as God wants to do something new. So I want to challenge you today. You have a duty to forget the past. 
Hey, if you refuse to forgive, if you carry a grudge, you swim in a sea of bitterness that will affect the people around you emotionally and mentally and relationally and spiritually. Your mind, my mind, the human mind, nor the human soul was designed to carry a grudge. Bitterness. It's a weight too heavy to carry and a poison that is so deadly to swallow. And it greatly affects everyday life. And so God is saying to us today, remember ye not the former thing. Neither consider the things of old. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. Well, Pastor Josh, I have no problem forgiving others. It's just myself I can't forgive. I've done so many horrible things. I, I just can't forgive myself. Well, for starters, let me just encourage you to think through this. You are limiting God's forgiveness. You're telling me that God, the creator of the universe, is willing and able to forgive you, but you can't forgive you? Get over yourself. You mean the God of heaven can forgive you and you can't forgive yourself? Not in a second. I believe the Apostle Paul struggled at times with this very thing. And this is why God had him write Philippians. I don't know if you're still in the New Testament. Go to Philippians 3.13 before we get to the fourth point. You say, how many points do we have? I don't know, but I like mathematics and I like a lot of points. Amen? Okay. Philippians chapter 3. The Apostle Paul. As far as I know... Nobody in here, as far as I know, I don't know everybody in here, but as far as I know, nobody in here has, has killed other Christians. But the Apostle Paul had a hand in having Christians killed. I guarantee you the devil came to him at times and just tried to beat him up over that. And God had him write this first. Look at Philippians 3.13. Philippians 3.13, which, by the way, Philippians is a book about joy. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. He says, I, I haven't reached the pinnacle. I haven't, re I haven't become the Christian that I, I'm still, I'm still working towards what God wants me to be. But this one thing I do, look at it now, forgetting those things which are behind. God had Paul write that. Why? Because no doubt at night, sometimes he probably laid down at night and he probably remembered Stephen's face. Stephen, one of the greatest men in the Bible, who he had a part in having stoned. And the devil probably came to him and said, yeah, you're a Christian now, but look what you did to those faithful Christians. And Paul had to say, forgetting those things. Some of you, you struggle with your past. And I want to just encourage you, if you're saved, hey, it's under the blood, amen? Hey, if you're saved, it's under the blood. You have a duty to forget the past. Some of you, I want to encourage you to come to the altar today and ask God to help you forgive, to ask God to help you in going forward and forgetting the past, a duty to forget the past. Let's go back to our text passage, Isaiah 43. Point number four, I want you to see a display of the new, even in the difficult or even in difficult times. Look at verse 19. So <clears throat> verse 19 begins with what word? Behold, that's a, that's a word of exclamation. God's saying, hey, follow me. It's like, you ever been talking to your kids? Hey, look, look this way. Hey, listen to me, right? God's saying, behold. He says, behold. And look what he says. I love it right here. Verse number 19. I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall ye not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. God wants to do something new. For some of you, you're not saved. You don't know Christ is your Savior. You're here today, you came, perhaps you were invited, perhaps uh, you've been thinking about coming, perhaps you have a longtime friend here. I don't know how you're here or why you're here, but God has you here today. And you know deep down in your heart, if you died today, you don't know, you go to heaven. You've never thought much about God. Maybe, maybe you believe in God, but you don't have any relationship with Him. I don't know where you are today, but God wants to do something new. He wants to make a new person of you. He wants to clean you from the inside out and give you a new beginning. If you would but repent and believe the gospel, the good news that Jesus died for you. He was buried and he rose again the third day for your sins. For others of you, he wants to put you on a new path. He wants you to get off the path you're currently traveling. He wants you to surrender to what he has for you. It might mean, get this now, leaving the path that you're on now, which is a good path, but then doing what God wants you to do. That's what I did. I was serving God in South Jersey, and things were going pretty well, actually, out there. But God came knocking on our door, and we had to make big decisions. 
but I decided I was going to do what God wants. Some of you sitting in here, God has been working on your heart for years. He's been knocking on your heart's door. You're saved, you know it, and he's been directing you to do something for him. He's been directing you maybe to go to the mission field. He's been directing you to, to serve in some way. He's been directing you to open your mouth and tell a neighbor, a friend, or a coworker you've worked with for 10 years about Jesus. And he keeps knocking at your door. And some of you need to decide, hey, it's time to do that. It's time to do that. And he, look at the word he uses there in verse number 19. I love it. I was studying this, Pastor Bemis, and I love this. Verse 19, behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall ye not know it? I will, what's the next word? Even. It doesn't say I will make a way in the wilderness. He says, I will even make a way in the wilderness. In other words, he says, it doesn't matter your situation. He says, hey, the difficulties of your life, it doesn't matter. He will even make a way in the wilderness. It matters not your family situation. God is bigger than that. It matters not your financial situation. God's bigger than that. It matters not how messed up your relationships are. God specializes in healing people. Amen? God's here today on February 11th. Of 2024 in the year of our Lord here at Bible Baptist Church saying, Behold, he says, pay attention, I'm going to do a new thing. And now it shall spring forth. And some of you are facing immense difficulties. I want to encourage you, take heart. God wants to do something new even in your desert, even in your wilderness. A declaration of who he is, a declaration of what he can do, a duty to forget the past, a display of the new, even in difficulty. I've just got two more points for you and they're short. Famous last words from pastors, Amen. Point number five, look at verse 21, a determined possession. Look at the first part of verse 21. This people have I formed for myself. Who's speaking in this passage? The Lord God. You say, how do you know it? Well, look up at verse 14. Just, this helps you as you study the Bible. It's always good to see who's the one doing the speaking. Thus saith the Lord, verse 14. All the way down here. This people have I formed for myself. A determined possession. Look back in verse 1 of the chapter. Now we didn't read this in the text. My dad led us in the passage. But a couple of these verses are very well known. Some of you might recognize them. Look at verse 1. But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel... Fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. What are the last three words of verse 1? Thou art mine. God's saying, hey, I, 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 I have a determined possession. And then that verse 2, which is such a wonderful, encouraging verse, when thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. God wants you for himself. And what a thought that the God of the universe, the creator, my savior, wants me for himself. What a God, what a savior. Now this determined possession results in the last point today. And I love this. I love this. I love this. I love that I'm studying the Bible and it's like a light goes on with other parts of the Bible. This determined possession results in the last point, a dynamic praise. Look at the last part of verse 21. So God says, this people have I formed for myself. He says, they're mine. He says, you're mine. You know, this week there's going to be a lot of cards given. You know, be mine. <laughs> Do you remember the little Valentine? You know, be mine. God says, God's the greatest lover in the universe. Amen. Hey, not, not, none of these, these love songs on the radio and these, uh, you know, these videos and all the different stuff, love movies. None of them have, they, they don't even hold a candle to God. He is the greatest lover ever. You want a good love story? Read the Bible. Amen? It's the greatest love story. Now, look at this. They shall show forth my praise. God has saved you for himself. So here's the question I have for you. Are you showing forth his praise? He didn't save you for your sake. You know, I'm thankful I'm saved. I'm thankful for all the benefits of salvation. But God didn't save me for me. He saved me for him. Amen. He saved me for him. So, here's the verse we're going to... So, Isaiah 43, 
This last verse, this people have I formed for myself, they shall show forth my praise. There's a wonderful cross-reference in the New Testament. We're going to end with that. So take your Bibles, turn to 1 Peter, and I'll be done. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 9. A determined possession. God says, this people I formed my, myself. He says, hey, you're mine. If you're saved, you're God's, and there's nothing more wonderful than knowing that you are God's. Uh, uh, he is mine, I am his. Praise God for that. But it results in a dynamic praise. They shall show forth my praise. But look at 1 Peter 2, 9. But ye, Peter speaking to, to Christians, ye are a chosen generation, a royal priest and a holy nation. And then look at this next phrase. Of what kind of people? Now, here's the funny thing about this, Brother Joel. <clears throat> Years ago, I used to think peculiar was just people that are nuts. And I thought, yeah, we're in the right camp because we're just a bunch of nuts, right? Right? I think, but that's not what it means. I was studying this, and a peculiar means a possession. You know, we, today, when we think of peculiar, we think of, you know, some of the people at the, the, the uh, progressive dinner last night. Amen? You say, which ones? I don't know. I'll let you figure it out. I don't know. Uh, but, but that's not what peculiar is. Peculiar is an owned people, a people possessed by the one, uh, uh, by God. That's what it means, that word peculiar. You look it up. I was looking at this, and then look at this, a peculiar people. That ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So you compare this with verse number 21 of Isaiah 43. This people that I formed for myself a peculiar people. They shall show forth my praise. Hey, God's called me out of the darkness. And now I ought to be going around telling people, hey, I'm saved. I'm saved. Praise God. I'm saved. He's changed me. He loves me, and he can do the same for you. Now, you don't need to walk into office tomorrow saying all that exactly. But as you talk with someone, and they share with you their struggles, because guess what? As you get to know someone, they'll share with you their struggles. Here's a secret. Everybody has struggles. Anybody know that? Yeah. And they'll open up, and you'll get to share your struggles, and then you get to share the one who helps you more than anybody. You know, I thank God for my wife. We've been married 27 years. And humanly speaking, she helps me more than anybody. But my Savior helps me more than anybody. Amen. I thank God for him. When God begins something new. I think he's going to do something new here at this church, but he wants to do something new in many of your lives. For some of you, you need Christ. Christ. For others of you, you've been saved, but God wants you to take that next step. Some of you already contacted me about church membership, and in the weeks to come, we'll talk about that and the importance of church membership and, and uh, what it means in the Bible. And, and uh, I want to encourage you, whatever step it is that God wants to do in your life new, don't resist it. God is in the business of making all things new. Heads bowed, eyes closed, if you would. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Nobody looking around. At this part of the service, if you're not familiar, we're about done. We really are. I'm done preaching. But I just ask that everybody bow their head, close their eyes. I'm going to just ask a couple questions, and then the piano will be playing, and we'll have a time to stand. And if you'd like to come to the altar, come to the steps and, and pray. I want to just ask a question. If you're here today, you say, Pastor, there was a day in my life where God made me a new creature. I was, I was lost in my sin, but Jesus saved me, and I know I'm saved. I, I'm not perfect, but I know I'm saved. Jesus Christ saved me through his blood. Is that your testimony today? Just slip your hand up if you know you're saved. If you know you're saved, just slip your hand up. You're saved from hell to heaven, saved from your sin. God bless you. You can put your hands down. If you're here today, say, Pastor, I don't know what it even means to be saved. I don't know what it means to be born again. I don't even know exactly what you were talking about, a new creature, but pray for me. I, I, would you be honest enough? I won't call you out. I won't embarrass you, I promise you, but I would like to pray for you. Anybody at all, say, Pastor, I'm not saved. Anybody at all, just slip your hand up. I don't, I don't know. I don't know Christ. I don't know the God of heaven. Anybody at all? Okay, I'm going to ask a question of Christians here today. One last question, and we'll stand to our feet. As my wife plays. I wonder who in here today, God has been knocking on your door about something. 
I don't know what it is, and maybe it's only between you and God, but you have felt the Holy Spirit nudging you. You've been saved for some time. It might have nothing to do with this church. It might be something just in your life. Say, Pastor Josh, I, God, the Holy Spirit, really spoke to my heart today. Pray for me that I had the courage, the duty to forget the past and be willing to go forward into the future with what God wants. Would you just slip your hand up? God bless you, many, many different hands. I wanna just encourage you. God said he'll make way even in the wilderness. Some of you have some very difficult situations. You say, how do you know? Just because you're part of the human race. I don't know what they are, but God knows. And I wanna encourage you in just a moment when we stand to our feet after I pray, come down to the altar and maybe just pour your heart out to God. Say, Lord, help me as I go forward. Please do a new thing in my life. Help me to have the courage the, to step out even in the wilderness because I know you'll make a way. Let's all stand. Lord in heaven, thank you for the message. You saw the hands, God. Thank you for working in hearts. Lord, if there's anybody here not saved, I pray today would be the day they would trust you as their personal savior. Please be with those that raise their hand, Lord. You're working in their hearts. Now bless the invitation, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.